Individual development is uh, now at the forefront and it's on everyone's lips. Um, away from team development, we also have the individual development that we have to get correct to move players into our first team. So we developed a template that is our template that is not right or wrong. It's uh, our opinion of how we do things and uh, we'd share that with you and hopefully get some ideas. But we'll start with George Bellow, who is our case study. If the clicker was on. Oh, there you go. So who is George Bellow? George Bellow possesses these tools. He has a growth mindset, for sure. Any, anything that goes wrong with George, injury, left out the squad, didn't make the 18, George does not sulk. He has an unbelievable mindset that just allows him to continue and want to be developed and want to be better. He has respect. He's a very respectful boy. He's a very respectful character. He respects his peers. He respects the staff. And he understands the process that he's in. And he's respectful of that. He's an excellent communicator. So he communicates with staff. He, the feedback you give him and he gives feedback to you. He's very, very good at that, which we feel helps him in his development. His attitude to succeed is second to none. George is a competitor and he has the attitude to win, to succeed at all costs, which we, which we felt was an unbelievable uh, attribute to him that made it easier for us to push him along. And then obviously, without saying, he's got top levels, top levels of athleticism and uh, he's got tons of natural ability. So we're not going to stand up here and say, we made George Bellow, we built George Bellow. George Bellow has a ton of natural talent and athleticism that continues to allow him to develop. So obviously that's what we call our great, okay? And that explains who George Bellow is. So, George Bellow's step to success. George Bellow, from eight to 13, he plays for local clubs in Atlanta. He plays for three or four different clubs. He plays in the number five position. He plays in the number 11 position, the number nine and the number 10. When his team was losing, he usually played the nine. When his team was winning, he played the five. But his last team played him as a 10. And I think what they did for him, they, they enhanced his view of the game and gave him lots of different views of the game. So for me, in those development years early, I think he got a good feel for who he was and what he was capable of doing. At age 14, he then joined Atlanta United. He came over to us and uh, went full-time on our U15-16 team. It's important to note that George never played his age group. The only time he ever played his age group was for the national team, which we'll talk about a little later. At 15, he signed his contract. He got a five-year contract and he started training with USL and then he was in with the first team. Every few days, Tata Martino would call him in as well. So at 15 is where we feel we really ramped up what we were doing for George. And then at 16, uh, he begins training pretty much full time with the first team and makes his first team de debut in the, uh, in the fall and uh, does very well. He plays again in the next game and plays almost a full 90 and scores, obviously, which catapulted him to a lot of global sort of hype. At age 17, he begins his first, first, uh, first game in CCL, one of the youngest players in the MLS to play in the CCL and does very well in that game. It was at 15 that we felt we needed to do something. Andrew Carlton, Goslin, Kunga, Akwanko had gone before him and they'd left the academy. And the question was posed, and I think it was Chris Little from Seattle, who I talk to regularly, who I have a lot of respect for. He said, what do you do with your young kids when they leave your academy? And the answer was, we don't do anything because they've gone with the first team. So now they're in the first team environment, training with the first team. And as an academy director and staff, we're looking at them, they've left us. So we're now saying, has he stopped developing? So we decided to try and put an IDP plan together, a template for our young pros, so that we kept connected with them and we could keep on the development trail pathway. Okay, so the pro pathway is development plan program. We had four parts to it. This is our template and this is how we sort of develop the, the pathway for him. You identify his strengths and his weaknesses. We examine why, okay, why are they weak and why has he got the strengths? And then set a plan of how to improve these things. 
and analyze the last pieces, analyze it with data and with your eyes and with the feeling of where you're at. So we constantly do that, and these are the four stages of our plan. So identifying strengths. As you'll see in this video, what George possessed was great timing, great athleticism, great one-on-one -on -one final third execution. Okay, you'll see in these videos, in these clips, he loved to get forward, he was an attacking left back whose timing into the final third was very good. Great speed, great power, but a little bit of what was lacking was his final product, which we'll get to in a minute, where we identified his weakness. But these were his strengths. He can beat one-on-one, -on -one, he can turn you inside out, and he can deliver. However, his deliveries weren't always what they should have been, which we'll get to in a little bit. But this clearly under, you can clearly understand his weapon, his strength, which is what we call his weapon, was getting into the final third, beating men, and uh, creating 1v1 situations. So, George's weapon, we felt that we needed to keep working on and get better, was his ability to beat a defender. His one-on-one -on -one and his cross, those were his weapons. And we needed to develop that as a strength. Obviously, we then will identify his weaknesses. So different crossing techniques and different moments, cues of the attacking teammates, and awareness of, of opposition positioning and defenders in the box. Those were the key things that we could hone in on and help him uh, individually develop. So we then identified his weakness. Okay, and as you'll see in these clips, George was very athletic and relied on his athleticism a lot. He switched off a lot during games when the ball was not in his area. You'll see here, there's a little tussle in the middle. It's in the 18-yard box and just George starts to walk, hand on his face, not really interested. Now he doesn't know where the defender's gone. Now we're in trouble. So that was him playing up, obviously, in the national final. Um, but again, these are the things we identified we could work on and make him a better player. Again, this is a pro game against Charlotte Independence. Ball leaves, there's no check of the shoulder, there's no awareness. But as you notice, he will run the defender down because this is what he's good at. Okay, and he gets back in a good position. But we felt he could have been in a better position to start with if he'd been aware and checking his shoulder and reading cues. So we identified his weakness. Anticipate the ball in behind, the back four, was a big weakness for George. Switching off his body position, not checking his shoulder, and not being aware of what was around him. So reading cues of the ball carrier, awareness of opposition runs, and awareness of teammates and gaps. He didn't work with the back four very well. He was a very individual player. So he was always detached from his left centre back, and we felt like that was a problem we could help fix. So. Then we examined why. Why were these things happening? Why is it that he does this? What, why is he good at it? Why is he bad at it? And we go into four categories. We've got medical, we've got technical, psychological, and tactical. These are the areas that we focused on and felt like if we got into these areas, we could help George in his weaknesses and his strengths. Obviously, we have the ability to do the medical testing because our partner is a huge children's hospital in Atlanta and across the country. Um, we obviously focused on technical individual work and group setting, so we did it in unit work and we did it with individually. And then the tactical analysis with video, obviously, and then the psychological individual meetings, and trying to figure out what George knew and what he didn't know, what he understood and what he didn't understand. So these were the areas that we worked on. And then we have to set a plan to how to improve. How are we going to help him? What is it we're going to do? So, we started with psychological analysis, which was a meeting with myself and Matt, the academy manager, and we showed him videos. We showed him videos of himself, we showed him videos of other people, we questioned him to see what he knew, we questioned him to see what he didn't know, and if he understood what we were getting at. So those, that's how we kind of attacked him with a psychological angle. So we would show him videos, like the one I showed you before against Charlotte, and highlight him, and ask him questions and ask him if he knew what he was doing wrong, why he was out of position, and then we would record his answers and record what he knew. And he did know a lot of the time, I didn't check my shoulder when the ball left my area, I wasn't aware, 
And then obviously the reading the cue of the ball carrier was his worst attribute. He could never understand why he was getting played in behind. So we had to try and shepherd him to, to understand he wasn't reading the cues of the, of the ball carrier or his, the cues of his teammates. So he was kind of just switching off when the ball was not in his area. We then took a player who's similar to George, had the similar uh, rise to fame, I guess is what you would say, as George, and has the same attributes as George. And then we tried to put that player in front of George and let him analyze, and analyze that player to get an idea of what he was doing and what this player did well that he was not doing. So this was Trent Alexander from Liverpool in the Premier League. We picked this guy because we felt like he had a lot of similar attributes to George. And then we asked him again to answer the questions of what does he do well, when does he do it, and encouraged him to answer and look at himself. So obviously he checks his shoulder, which was George's bad trait that he possessed at first. And he could also read the cues of the ball carrier and drops at the right time to clean up the mess. And his body position was right at the start. So by using players at this level of high level clips, it helped George understand what he needed to do and how he needed to do it. And by picking a player that was similar to him, we tried to provoke that with him. So then we went into the technical analysis work and we worked with Rob Valentino, who's the assistant now to Frank De Boer. He did a lot of the field work. After training, after USL training, Rob would take George away. Matt Lowry, the academy manager, also was doing it. And Matt was responsible for putting the plan together. So now when we go into our technical, te sorry, technical and tactical, we did a lot of unit work with the back four to show him what he needed to do. We had a ton of exercises that we've done with him. I'm not going to, I've only limited on time, so I'm not going to show you everything we did with him. But to give you an idea, as we went forward, we started to add players. So we had different cues. We set up different organizations so that he had to, to read and obviously work with his left center back, which he wasn't good at. He wasn't good at positioning off the left center back at all. So we tried to form exercises that encouraged that. We added in a six. So now he's got the cues of the six. And then we added in balls in behind and worked individually with him on the cues, his body shape, checking his shoulder. So this is kind of how we went into the technical piece with George. We also worked on the flip side, which was his strengths. Because we don't have to forget about his strengths, because he was very, very good at getting the final third. But his delivery of his weapon was poor. So we had to try and work on that. So we worked exercises of working with the... Uh, the cues of his forwards to deliver better choices. So we've set the plan. Now we have to set a plan of how we're going to do all that. So now we put it to plan. So if you look at this, these are the teams George was involved with. He was involved with the 19s for meaningful games against MLS competitions. He was involved with the 17s for events like this at GA Cup where he could come play against Flamengo, Lyon, all the teams that are here. Those are meaningful games that we did not want him to miss out on. So he was involved with the 17s there. He was also involved with A2, playing and training with A2. And everything was periodized for George, as you'll see in a second. But the overriding was the first team. If Tata Martino wanted him with the first team, that was the, that was the priority. So all of this could be gone if he got dragged into the, the first team sessions. But what we thought was, after GA Cup, which George has played at the GA Cup every, every year. He could play this year, but obviously he's beyond the GA Cup at what we feel. Um, we thought we could get really stuck into him and really get into his individual piece. April through June was a big block where we thought we could get a lot of minutes on the clock. So this was his schedule. As you can see, it was packed. He also, at this point, I'll note that he was playing for the U15 national team and the U17 national team. So. He was in for every camp with the 15s and every 17s camp. So it started to get a bit of where he was getting pulled in a lot of different directions. We still wanted to do our IDP, but we obviously were working with the national team as we thought that was good for him. We then put in our IDP moments when we felt we could get sessions in between everything and periodized that. Obviously, this is the next six weeks of it. That's where he goes to Japan, and we'll get to that in a second. 
So these are the moments that we felt we could fit in the IDP sessions and really dig down into his strengths and weaknesses. So we made the plan. We got with sports science, which is a big part of our club, and uh, made sure that the minutes were correct, the load was correct, so that we weren't overdoing it with George and we could get maximum effect effectiveness with the sessions that we have. So we took the whole plan and went through all every week and figured out how, much, how many minutes we could get with him. And we came up with 705 minutes of extra IDP. And for us, that was a good block of us working in small groups, individually and within the team, focusing on George. Again, he was pulling the first team a lot at, at, this, at this time, so some of it was obviously altered as we went. But going back to uh, the schedule here, everything was going to plan, everything was great, but I'm going to stand here and I'm going to be honest, I'm going to hold my hands up. At this point, this happened. So George sustained a very bad groin soft tissue injury. Now, it was when he came back from Japan. We're not laying blame anywhere. It could have been us. It could have been the training load. We don't know. There's no answers to how it happened. But when he came back from Japan, he had a very, very deep, bad groin injury in the soft tissue. It was definitely from overuse. It was his right. It wasn't his left. But it was definitely an overuse injury, and we know that. So now, with our template and with our process, we now have to tweak things and say, right, did we do too much? Was it too heavy a load? Was playing for two national teams too much? Was going in with the first team too much at 15? We don't know. But this is why we have the plan, and this is why we have the template to figure that out. So then we have to analyze the growth and analyze how he's doing and is it working? Is our plan, is our template working? So what we did was we gave him individual numbers. So these are his individual numbers from GA Cup. Because everything we did, we used GA Cup as our benchmark because it was against the best competition in the world that we had. And we used our professional games against our MLS competitors as benchmarks. We didn't use the DA as much as we used GA Cup and the uh, MLS games. So these are his individual actions. We then sat down and said, okay, two-way street, these are your numbers. You give us a goal, you give us a number that you want to see, that you want to attain in the next, and we picked a few things like possession to regain the play. And then George gave us his numbers. Because he felt if he got his numbers up, the team would have his, their numbers up and the team would perform better. And we agreed. So. We went through that. Then we went through the growth of the team. So these are team numbers. And then we asked George to give us a team number that he felt if he was doing well, the team would do well. And these are the numbers that he came up with. And again, we allowed him to dictate the numbers. We didn't tell him, this is your number and this is what you're doing. He had to come up with that number. Some were realistic, some weren't. Again, crosses, attacking duels which is what his weapon is, and he, he put his numbers pretty high. Same thing with the team development. Okay, so to analyze his growth of his weapon, of his strength, we gave him a report card, agreed qualitative targets that he had to come up with with us and agree on them and then work from there. The agreed actions and then his grades were put in as we went. So that was after six weeks. Obviously, the 12 weeks we'll get to, we, can't, we didn't get results. Because he got injured, we couldn't get the 12-week results. So the last four weeks he was injured of this period, we didn't manage to get his results. Again, that's something we have to look at and say, did we do too much? Was he doing too much? Was this all too much for him? Again, we did the same thing with his weaknesses. Red light, red light yellow light or green light. And again, we, we, every six weeks, we would look at it and say, where's the improvement and analyze the growth in his improvement. But on the other hand, these things here are just as good as data sometimes. And we have to see what the player is doing to see if, we can, if he's made a difference or if we've helped him make a difference with the training. So some video here of George in professional games. This is uh, a few weeks ago. So if you look back a year and a half ago of what he would have delivered there and what he's delivering now, you'll see he recognizes his teammates' cue and he puts a different ball in than he did a year and a half ago. 
And in all three of these clips, you'll see a different delivery. But what George has done is, is now starting to pick out the passes instead of just slamming the ball across the box. That was, in the, that was the first team game against New England. There was 55,000 in the building that night, so 17-year-old playing in that. And I think this one really shows his growth of using his weapon and picking out a better cross than a year and a half ago where he would have probably just whipped that across the box and hoped. So we're seeing good things out of him. We're seeing improvement out of him. And that's, we feel, is an improvement on our part of what we've been doing with him. And then obviously his weakness, his anticipation in defending, we felt like, has that improved? So again, game video and training video. This is a video from training. Uh, at the end of February, he actually picked up another knock, so he's been out. But as you see in this video, the things we've been trying to push on him, his body shape, his angle, his checking of his shoulder, his awareness of his opponent is much, much better than it was 16 months ago. He gets in a good position. And he's in a much better starting position than running it down. This clip is from the Champions League. So again, in Costa Rica, first game of the Champions League, his awareness of his gaps in his teammates now, we feel, has improved. While it's not perfect, he's still 17, he's still learning, we feel it's improved. And the exercises that we've been doing with him have put him in a better position. He actually played okay that game. Again, reading cues, which was another deficiency. Again, another professional game where he's dropped in and he's, 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 he's took up a better starting position than he would have. We feel like a year and a half ago, he would have been having to run 30 yards to recover because he might have been a little bit switched off. So, on the field, what are we doing now as far as development and trying to keep him involved? Myself, Matt and Rob, we devise his plan and he continues to work IDP two days a week with first team assistance. He continues to check in with me every month. He uh, comes and sits down and we talk life, we talk football, we talk Premier League, we talk everything. It's just a talk to check in and keep him connected to us so that we are, when we're trying to develop him, he still has the connection to the academy. He's not, he's not an academy player, we don't view him as an academy player, but we keep on that development plan which comes from the academy up. It doesn't come from the first team down to the academy. So we feel 17 years old, 18 years old, he's still part of our development plan, even though he trains with USL and first team. We are still responsible for his development of the strengths and weaknesses that he, he's been dealing with. Off the field, we're trying to do it holistically so that we give him everything. And uh, we do cooking class with him every month. So there's 12 of our young pros that are under 21 and they cook every month in our kitchen with the chefs and they learn to make themselves food. Healthy options that will help them as soccer players. So once a month, all our young pros do that. They have a financial literacy class with uh, SunTrust and uh, they come in once a month, teach them about saving money, about credit, about careers after soccer. It's a, it's a really good program that again, our young pros are all in and George has to go to that. It's mandatory that they go to that. They check in every morning with the player personnel manager. So every time they come in, they have to come in half an hour before the first team players. So the young pros have to get there half an hour before the first team players can roll in 10 minutes before, but our young pros have to get there early. They check in, they fill in the wellness log, and that's all they have to do. And then after training, it's mandatory they eat at our training ground. A lot of them were just leaving after training and we didn't know what they were doing. So again, we changed that to say, right, there's food here, there's a nutritional plan here, you've got to eat at the training ground. So they have to eat breakfast when they check in and they eat lunch when they leave. It's mandatory. They cannot skip the meals. And obviously we've got our nutrition performance now and mental coach once a month. And the mental coach is optional. They don't have to do it, but it's option. And they've players like Andrew and Chris who were very young and got a lot of money and got a lot of stardom very early, are using the mental coach, I think, to get reset. And they've turned the corner and they're doing really well. But we didn't have the opportunity to do that with these first homegrowns. So now this is our template for uh, 
going forward. Then they continue to help with the community. So it's really important to Arthur and AMB Sports that we continue in the community. So our academy teams are always in the community, 17s and 19s, but now our young pros must do community service. Feed the veterans, homeless, uh, cancer wards, the hospital cancer wards. Basically once a month, the community has something for our young pros to do, and it's mandatory, they have to go. And to be fair, they do a really good job, and a, they do a really good job of it. So that's our template. The results, obviously, at the moment are not concrete because he got injured and we didn't get the final results. The numbers that we gave to him on a side note were youth to youth. They weren't youth to pro. So now he's in the pros, we can't use those numbers and those percentages against the pro game because it's a completely different game. So now we have to try and, again, revamp his numbers based on professional games rather than youth to youth. If that makes sense, going back to the other slides. But that's our template, that's how we did it, and that's how we will continue to do it um, until we look at it again and maybe change direction again. But at the moment, we feel good that we are continuing our development of George Bello, even though he's in with the first team, playing with the first team. And then the last part of it is we've got to get him in the first team and we've got to get him playing minutes because that's the most important part. Thank you. Question time? Sure. Okay. And if you guys have questions, we'll get there. Uh, out on Twitch, if you guys have questions, get them in. I'll get them sent to me, and, and we'll get your questions up here as well. Uh, Tony, I want to thank you for that. That took a ton of work. I appreciate putting that together. No problem. Um, start with the basics. What is your process for building that plan, which clearly took you and your staff a lot of hours? Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, we collaborate a lot as a staff. Uh, the staff are a very tight group that are willing and open enough to contribute to the, the whole plan. Matt Lowry, who's the academy manager, is, I've got to give Matt the, the genius behind the structure of it all. Um, and he puts it together for us and he monitors it, which is, is a big job, but Matt's done a great job with that. Um, but as far as who we place in that program, it's probably down to me and Matt at the end of the day where we say, this guy is what we feel has the potential and we project him. So we've got a kid here now who's an 04, and we can start this process even earlier with him because he's only 14 years old, but we feel we can project him to be a first team player. So now we can start and use the template and the pieces of the template to really expose him, which is why we brought him here and played him in the games. So that's kind of how we project who it is that's gonna happen. That plan that you showed us, how long did it take you guys to put together just so people out there are thinking about doing the same, they have a sense of what it takes? Well, some of it was already in place. We've tried a few different methods of IDP because the individual is more important to us now than the teams and the standings of our teams. We've got to focus on individuals and we've got to get individuals through to the first team. It's our number one priority. So there was pieces of it that were already in place, but it was kind of being done in separate departments. And then Matt brought it all together and said, right, here's a plan, probably took them 12 months, over a period of 12 months, discussions, collaborations with other people. But at the end of the day, it probably took a good year to figure out, right, this is our template, this is what we're going to do, fail or succeed, this is the template. And how do you communicate that to George? Is it on the field, is it an office, is his family there? How do you communicate that much information to a 15 year old? We attacked him from many different angles. So we brought his family in regularly and told them what we were doing and how we were doing it before we signed the contract. Um, we attack him in an office, obviously the psychological piece with myself and just the conversations that we have and steering him. Um, on the field, in team training we do it, in individual work and in small groups. Because obviously with it being a left back, there was individual pieces, but the small group piece was more important because his weakness was his, his relationship with the left centre back and the whole four. So we felt like that was a good place for us to do the most work, which is what we did. So we try to attack him from different angles, but he's a very, very respectful guy from a really good family, and his family are bought into everything that we do. And what is your strategy for giving him all this information, saying, George, you need to improve at X, Y, and Z, but actually stay confident and keep having belief in yourself? Him? Yeah, is there anything specific or a way you phrase your, or go about it? Not really. 
again, going back to the first slide, George's mindset, his attitude, his drive, and his natural ability keeps him pretty motivated. I mean, he's been pretty down, right? He picked up that bad injury, and then he went pre-season. He just turned 17, and he went to pre-season with the first team for the whole pre-season. He came out of that. He played in the CCCL, and he was, on the, he was going, and all of a sudden, he pulls up and training the night before the Monterey game. So he was going to play against Monterey in the Benz, which was like, for a 17-year-old, an amazing place. We'll say that was the difference maker. That yeah. was it. George. George is the difference maker. There you go. I'll keep it short. <laughs> um, going back to that injury, George Bello, a, a, a quick player. Would you do this differently for a fast twitch player compared to a slow twitch player based on injury probability? No. No? No. Those are my questions. There Easy answer. Keep it short, sweet. You guys have any questions? <coughs> so I'm just curious, Tony, with your IDP plan for George, when we're talking about the first team staffs, right, you have Tata and his staff, and now you have Frank. Was there any uh, challenges for you starting the IDP from the academy standpoint and then implementing it and getting buy-in from the first team staffs, if any, issues? And then what's the difference between working with Tata's staff now and Frank's as you continue the plan? That's two questions. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, listen, Tata Martino was probably very, very open about everything. And he was very welcoming of youth players in his sessions. So to have the youth players training with him every Thursday, he probably brought 10 to 12 youth players into training. So George was exposed to that straight away. And he didn't have anything to do with IDP. He agreed that we needed to do it. And he actually recommended George's weakness to us and said, look, you need to look at this with him, blah, blah, blah. And he was really helpful in that way, and his staff was really helpful in that way. But equally, Frank's staff now are very interested in developing him as well. Because in the end of the day, I think he's Frank's left back starter when he's not injured. So they're really interested in it as well. So neither staff are shutting the door on it and saying, oh, when we don't care about it. They're very involved. And Frank made the statement, look, I don't care how old he is. If he's good enough, he's playing. So from a staffing perspective, we've got a pretty good relationship with both staffs. And uh, it's been fairly easy for us to implement our ideas without anybody getting in the way. Yeah, I kind of heard you say that you would choose, you chose George as, as is because obviously his potential, you guys saw and, and wanted to invest in him. With all your other academy players that you have, is there something else that you do with them? Um, you know, because who has a crystal ball yet? You don't know. Is there other individual development plans that you work with them? Maybe a little less yeah. uh, detailed or complex yeah. as that? Projection's the hardest thing, right, for any of us, is to project who's the one that's going to make it, who's the one we've got to give everything to. Um, and you don't get it right all the time. But basically, we have kind of three levels of IDP. So our first level is this. Our two, maybe one or two guys that we feel are on that track, we may do more in certain age groups going forward if we feel we have more potential. Uh, underneath that, we have our, what we call our Triple P, which is our Pro Pathway program, where there are six to 12 players across three age groups that we feel are, again, very good, they need extra, and they work with me twice a week in the mornings at 11 o'clock. And then underneath that, we have unit work IDP within our training. So if a training on a Tuesday or Thursday is a two-hour block, the first 30 minutes is individual units, working on the individual units of the team. So position specific for midfielders, backs and forwards. And that way, that's where we feel we get IDP to everybody, but we really have to produce George Bello. So that's why we put all our resources in that top slot. Do the other guys on your team know that there's one or two who are on a special plan? Yeah. Yeah. You're very you're upfront about that. Very open about it, and it's something they want to drive to to achieve. It's up to them, but yeah, everyone knows the the levels of it. Quick question from Twitch. Yeah. Did George play other sports early in his sporting career? Not that I'm aware of. I asked him, and he said from seven. He played organized soccer mm -hmm. from eight years old. That's what he said. Do you have other players who are solid twelve, fourteen year olds that do play other sports? 
And we have our own it? sports series that we do mm. within training. So we have jiu-jitsu, we have uh, badminton, rock climbing and judo, uh, sorry, gymnastics. Mm. That, that, that's incorporated in our 12s and 13s already. Mm. But there are some of our 12s and 13s that are basketball players mm -hmm. and we allow them to play basketball. And while they're a 12 and 13 year old, I don't want to take that away from them. Tony, great presentation. Um, is, is, is George the first player you put through this? This program? template? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it was, the reason was Andrew and Chris left the academy and we didn't know what to do or didn't know what they were doing. So we didn't want to just let George go without continuing what we'd started. So that's for the future. Hopefully we'll be allowed to continue to develop well there with the first team or the USL. Having the USL is great because it's a pathway now. So now we can put our guys into USL pro games and training. That's not first team, but it's in between. Hi. Uh, for the weekly playing sessions what, that you incorporated games and national team, do you do that for every player or just for IDP players? Just the IDP. Oh, sorry. I didn't understand your question. One more time. For the weekly planning sessions that you were incorporated first team training under 17s, depending on which team he was going to be on, do you do that for every player or just for the IDP player? Every age group is periodized. If they're with the national team, they obviously get a periodized plan separate to what the training sessions are. But everything's periodized all the ages from 14 up. Here, question. Tony, from this successful story about yeah. Yeah, I think, listen, you, you use George, you use Andrew, you use George. Andrew and George are probably our two most successful products. And we've only been going three years, right? So it's not like we've got 12 years of putting these kids in and using them. George will be on the door. There's an academy door between the first team and the academy wing at our facility. George is now going on the door with a motivational speech thing beside him, which we're going to try and use to say, look, this is the guy who was one of you, and you can move through this door as well. But these are the things you have to do to get through the door. So now is where we've built our culture, we've built the sort of culture of our academy. As we continue to do that, it'll be, we'll be using those characters to say, you can do this too. That helps, but you've seen a lift in, since he started playing for the first team, and when he scored, the whole academy was like going crazy about it. So we're trying to use those pieces to try and motivate other players to say, I've got those attributes, I can do that, and hopefully it spreads, right? But again, we're so young, it's kind of, we need more of them. Another great question from Twitch, if we get one more in from Twitch, is what time do all the different teams train? First Team USL Academy, and how do you factor that in to something like youth player development? It's a challenge. Um, obviously, we have a fantastic facility that was built for us, so we've got a lot of space and a lot of time and a lot of use that we can use. But the first team go at 10, the USL goes at 10.30, so that if the first team need them players, they get dragged in there. On the field next to it. Yeah, so yep. the first team and then the USL are right below them. Um, our younger academies are in the evening. Um, we try to get our 1917s in when we can during the day, which we have a hybrid school that we work with, which was where most of our better players go, um, our prospect players, so we can bring them in at any time and it's flexible, but they still train in the evening most of the teams train in the evening because we haven't got a school of our own. So it's a challenge, but if the first team want the 19s or the USL want the 19s or the 17s players, they're pretty flexible and we can get them in within two or three hours notice. Cool. So there's a lot of that going on. Away from the team training individuals. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think some of the late bloomers that we've got in our academy is why we added a gap year team, because we didn't want them to stop the process. So now Matt came up with the biobanding training at uh, 15 and 16. So our best 16s who are small train with our 15s who are the same size. So the, the way we've set that gap year team up, which is where all our late bloomers, we hope, are going to come from, they're in, they have an individual unit work, so they're working individually at times, but they're also training against kids that are the same sort of competitiveness, size and everything. That's working out pretty well as well. So we're trying to tweak things. Obviously, there's no crystal ball that says he's going to make it and he's not. You just don't know. But you've got to try and project the ones that you feel are. And yeah, George is a special talent. I mean, George is an incredible athlete, but George had some weaknesses that we had to address. Otherwise, he may not have made it. He may have always said, oh, well, he switches off. He doesn't check. He doesn't. But that was our job was to try and change him in the limited time that we had with him. Put it on the mic so that they can, uh, yeah. Who makes the decisions for the academy? Who signs uh, to the USL team from your organization? I do. Uh, me and Carlos. Basically, my role now is to manage our academy players into the USL and manage the USL roster. So he and I sit down and say, right, who's on an amateur for a while? But well, we need to look at them. We then say, okay, who from them do we want to sign to a professional contract? Whether it's USL homegrown, we don't really tag it. You're getting a professional contract from Atlanta United. So that's kind of how we look at it, and we try and explain it that way. But it's just myself and Carlos who sit down with Stephen, the USL coach, who came from the academy, and we sort of pick at the players and say, right, who do we really need to do this with? Who needs to go to school? Who's not a pro? So we make all those decisions within our own little circle. Uh, you talked about the staffs in general with the first team staff working with them. Sorry? Was there, when you talked about the staffs, when uh, Junior asked about the first team staff working with them with the IDP program, is there one assistant, though, that takes over and kind of manages that process for that first team? Or Yeah, Rob Valentino. So Rob's the guy who will take young pros after training or he'll take the academy top kids that are in USL after training. Um, but he did a lot of the work with George on the field. So it's credit to Rob that he actually, and Rob's a good defender, so he actually worked a lot with him. Um, but we all kind of share the load as an academy staff. We've got a good staff and it's very collaborative that don't mind doing the extra work. So luckily the players get the benefit of that. Nice. One more question we have time for. My, my last question for you is, we went through the whole presentation. We saw it was up there. What is on the, the top of your list that you think you might revisit or reiterate as you implement for the, this for the next player? I think schedule of national team events in conjunction with what we're doing, we need to communicate better with them and say, look, this is what we're doing. I know you're taking them for camp, but this is what we've been doing and then get the information from them, what they did when he was away. Do we have to back him down for a week or two and allow him to rest because of what he did at camp? I think there needs to be better communication from us to them, telling them our objectives and what we're trying to do. And then obviously managing the whole schedule of a young guy who is still growing, who is still developing, and just making sure that we don't push too hard or do too much. Because, I mean, that injury could have been caused by our individual training. We don't know. So we've got to really manage that. But that's why we have a template, so that we can adjust the template and adjust everything that we're doing. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. Thank you. Tony Annan. Everyone out there, thanks for tuning in on the Twitch stream. Don't forget, the finals of the Premier Division, Championship Division, can be seen on this channel tomorrow. See you.